Uh, I got a couple of uh, housekeeping items uh, before we get into the, the text. Uh, first, um, uh, for Monday and Wednesday of next week, I'm going to be gone. Uh, I mentioned earlier this week, I think that uh, the uh, vice president of health sciences, his mom passed away, mother passed away. And uh, I, I think at this point, I've, it's probably known or I've mentioned it that uh, the uh, chaplain is my mother-in-law. And so Joe Haynes, vice president of health sciences, is also my father-in-law. Um, and so I'll be going to this funeral. Uh, it's my, my wife's grandmother and uh, her, her last grandparent. Uh, and so we're going to the funeral in South Carolina. Um, and so I'll be, we'll be leaving on Monday to make the trip there for the funeral on Tuesday and then make the trip back on Wednesday. So I won't be here on Monday or Wednesday of next week. Uh, instead, I'll be giving you some online stuff, uh, some assignments through Google Classroom. Uh, it may be if I've got if I've got something that lines up well with where we are uh, from previous classes, I may give you a, a lecture that I recorded from last year. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'll probably give you some reading and and a quiz to go with it, and I'll give you some uh, reading grade and and be your attendance score for the day as well. Uh, but there's no need to come here on Monday and Wednesday of next week. I won't be here. Your assignments will be on on Google Classroom. Uh, so we'll be back. I'll be back on Friday next week. Uh, that also means that if you missed the exam last Friday or on Wednesday of this week, normally you have one week to make it up, which would be next Wednesday, and I'm going to be gone Monday and Wednesday. So that didn't give you a lot of opportunity. So you'll have until next Friday to make up the exam if you missed it. I don't think any of y'all missed it, did you? Think y'all are all here. Uh, but. Anybody else, if you know anybody else in the class that missed it, I haven't gotten to check it against the roll yet to see if everybody in the class took it, but uh, if you know anybody that has missed it, make sure that you know they, they get this message. I'll put it on Google Classroom as well. But, uh, you can take it until next Friday, uh, or you can take it next Friday. And if you can't do it next Friday for whatever reason, let me know and I'll try to arrange for you to take it with somebody else next week while I'm gone. And that's a little thornier, a little harder, but it, it might be possible. We'll do our best. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's it for the, the housekeeping stuff. Don't come on Monday and Wednesday. Instead, look on Google Classroom for assignments and, and I'll be, I'll be gone. Um, so today we're, we're going to look at the life of Solomon. Basically, we're going to see the very end of David's life and then the reign of his son Solomon and things that Solomon does during his reign. And before we get into that though, there's, Something I want to show you so that you'll know you'll know what what these First and Second Chronicles what they are. Uh, we talked about earlier when we got into First and Second Samuel that First and Second Samuel were actually originally one scroll, but because of a scroll length and the difficulty of maintaining and caring for a big scroll, they chopped it in half and turned it into two scrolls. So you have First and Second Samuel, but originally it was just Samuel. Well, the same is true for First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. They were originally one scroll each, and then chopped in half. And so, First and Second Kings was originally just the annals of the kings, and First and Second Chronicles was originally just the chronicles of Judah. Uh, and so, these these two books they're actually um, covering a lot of the same material, but they have two very different focuses and approaches. Uh, so, we have in First and Second Kings we have the annals of the kings of Israel and Judah. Uh, and so we, in First and Second Samuel, what we've had is the story of first Saul and then David, the first two kings of Israel uh, during the United Monarchy. And then in First and Second Kings, we'll get in the first part of First Kings, we'll get the life of Solomon, the third king, the last king of the United Monarchy. And then after the kingdom divides, we get the stories of the kings, the, the records of the kings from both kingdoms. And so the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah, after they're divided, we get the stories of both kings, both, both kingdoms in this one set of records. And so it's the, the annals of the kings of Israel and Judah. And in the middle of this, we also get the story of, kind of the, the first and probably, or at least the, the most famous probably prophet in the Old Testament, Elijah, and then his, his successor, Elisha, which gets a little confusing, but we'll get to 
we'll get you there. Uh, but we get the, the stories of those prophets Elijah and Elisha. But the, the bulk of the material in First and Second Kings is a history of these, the, the leaders of these two kingdoms. The kings of the northern kingdom and the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, First and Second Chronicles is going to cover some of that same material, but instead of focusing or giving us the life and, and times or giving us the, the court records of the kings of Israel and Judah, we're just going to get the chronicles of the kingdom of Judah. And the author of Judah or of, of Chronicles is is concerned with showing us the the whole sweep of the of God's involvement. It wants to show that the kingdom of Judah is is God's chosen people and that this is you know this is who they are. And so he actually starts with a very brief summary summary starting from Adam. Uh, and gives you the, the very brief rundown of the history of God's interactions with the people down through Jesse, the father of David. And then starting with David, we get this very thorough account of David's life and then Solomon after him. And then we get an account of the kings of Judah because they are the ones that descend from David. The kings of the northern kingdom don't have the the relationship with David that the kingdoms of the, uh, the kings of the southern kingdom do. The southern kingdom, Judah, is the continuation of David's kingdom, but the northern kingdom that's called Israel is a separate system, separate branch. They're not related to David. Uh, so in a lot of cases, you'll get parallel stories. You may even get exactly the same language, like copied verbatim from one to the other, and so you get exactly the same thing in both places in some cases, but in, in Chronicles, you're getting a focus only on the southern kingdom, Judah and its rulers and things that happened there. In first, second Kings, you're getting the broader scope of, it's a much shallower look at, the, at both kingdoms at the same time. And so we're gonna follow the storyline in first and second Kings uh, and we may, we're going to consult First and Second Chronicles a little bit, bring in some extra detail. But for the most part, we're just going to look at First and Second Kings because this is a survey class. It's, it's kind of only hitting the introduction and the surface anyway. And First and Second Kings gives us that. First and Second Chronicles is, is very useful for some other stuff and for, for deeper dives. But for our purposes, we're just going to use First and Second Kings. But I wanted you to know what First and Second Chronicles are. And then when we get after that, when we get done with this section of the divided kingdom, uh, when we get to the Babylonian exile and then the return from exile, uh, the stories of the exile are contained, or the, the return from exile are contained in Ezra and Nehemiah, which is another situation of a single scroll that was split. It was originally Ezra and Nehemiah, and then it was, was split, and then each half was named after the most prominent figure in each one. So all, all of these history books kind of have that in common. First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah, they were all, each of them, it was originally one scroll and they were split into two, and so four stories became eight. Clear as mud? Awesome. There's also a little kind of a quality in First and Second Chronicles that they, because they're focusing on God's faithfulness and, and trying to show God working through the kingdom of Judah, they tend to gloss over some of the worst moments of the biggest heroes in Judah. And so, for example, the story of Bathsheba doesn't happen in First and Second Chronicles. Most other things they have more details on, but they kind of gloss over David's worst moment because they, they want to show the, the progression of, of David's uh, family and the descent from David's line. And so they kind of play up David as a greater hero and leave out some of his, his worst moments. Uh, so we're going now, we're looking at 1st and 2nd Kings. Uh, specifically today, we're going to look at 1st Kings chapters 1 through 11 at the story of Solomon's life. And so Solomon, you know, David got, you know, a book and a half, basically, but Solomon is only going to get 11 chapters of 1 Kings. Uh, and Solomon, first, I guess, first of all, what do y'all, what do you know about Solomon? What, what do you think of when you, when you think about Solomon now? The lead singer for Jeremy Forsman. <laughs> Not where I was going. Um, okay. Ancient Solomon, uh, uh, son of David, king of Judah, or of Israel. How about, let me qualify. He's considered the wisest of his kings. Yeah, considered wise, uh, a very wise king, even, even the wisest man that ever lived in some cases. Associated with a lot of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, especially the Proverbs. Uh, and then there's the Song of Solomon, which is actually a, a kind of extended semi-erotic love poet, a poem. Uh, We'll get there later, but it's 
it's kind of graphic sometimes, but called the Song of Solomon. Uh, what else? Anything else that you know? I mean, that's that's usually the first thing. The thing that most people remember is wise king, wise man that ever lived, potentially. Anything else? Well, he's also known for having built the temple. He's David is not allowed to build the temple to God, and so but David has promised that his son will be able to, and so Solomon is the one that ends up building the temple. So he's well known for that. It's even called Solomon's Temple from uh, from that point on, uh, or when it's remembered later, it's called Solomon's Temple, uh, and that the temple turns out to be one of the wonders of the ancient world. I mean, if you're looking for you know, the the most impressive feats of engineering and art in ancient history, you know, pre pre modernism, pre enlightenment. Solomon's temple is always in, you know, the top seven, the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it, very impressive achievement, very incredible building. Um, he's also known for having brought great wealth to Israel, although as we get into the story, you'll see that it maybe it wasn't so much great wealth for all of Israel as great wealth for Jerusalem and the surrounding area and other parts of Israel were probably suffering. Um, but the, he, he's known for bringing this prosperity and this kind of golden age of peace and, and wealth to Jerusalem and Israel. Um, so yeah, that's generally the way that Solomon is known, as being extremely wise, built the temple, brought great wealth and prosperity to Israel. And so it is probably going to be a little surprising when we look at the text and we see that Solomon had a lot of issues. And... There's not, 1 Kings 1 through 11 doesn't really ever directly accuse Solomon of doing anything wrong until like the very end when he, he messes up and commits idolatry. Um, but it, it, he's never really accused of doing anything wrong directly in the text, but there's all these, this description of the things that he does. And if you, when you just read that as a description of what he did, it's just data and it doesn't hit you what it means for the people involved. But when you think through what it really means for the people involved, you see that there's there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, or there's a lot of stuff that's happening that Solomon is doing that is actually not good. And there'll be this building comparison. Again, it's kind of a subtle thing, but there's this building comparison between Solomon and the Pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, and by the end of it, it'll it'll be kind of clear, hopefully, what that comparison is and how it works out. And there's a, a major ironic twist at the end of Solomon's life. Um, but Solomon's story begins, 1 Kings chapter 1, David is still alive, but we're told that David has gotten to be very old. Uh, he's got to be a very old man, and he's kind of weak and frail in his old age. He's still the king, but he's kind of in bed a lot. And it, it turns out that even, even in bed and with covers, he can't stay warm anymore. He's, he's old, he's frail, and he, he just shivers. He's so cold. And one of the advisors, one of his advisors, makes a suggestion that they find a, a young woman, uh, a virgin, to come and take care of him during, you know, take care of him while he's sick and to get in bed with him and sleep with him at night to keep him warm. And so they, they follow the suggestion and they find uh, a beautiful young virgin named Abishag the Shunammite. I'm not putting that in for you to remember for the test, but I always think that it's a little unfortunate that this beautiful young woman is named Abishag. This does not sound like a, a beautiful feminine name, but, you know, what do I know about Hebrew naming customs in the, you know, 4th, 5th, 6th century? It's more like 7th or 8th century, probably BC. Uh, but, it, you know, what I know. Uh, but Abishag the Shunammite is the young woman that is chosen to, to take care of the king and to keep him warm. Uh, and the text is explicit that that David never has sex with her. They, they never have relations. It's, she she literally sleeps in the bed with him to keep him warm, but but they don't have sex. Um, he's a, he's an old failing man, and, and she's a young woman. It kind of makes sense that they might not, but you know it, it also sounds kind of hinky. Uh, but she's sleeping with him at night to keep him warm. And during this period when you know David's health is declining, he's he's not as able as he used to be. Uh, one of his sons decides to take things on himself and make himself king. Uh, Solomon has been promised that uh, David promised Bathsheba that Solomon would become king after him. Uh, Solomon is the son of Bathsheba, and being his last wife added to the the group, uh, Solomon is not the eldest of David's sons. 
Uh, there's another son that is younger than Absalom who was killed in the last uh, story that we had where, where he rebelled against David and was killed in the battle afterwards. Uh, but this, this guy, the son Adonijah, is younger than, than Absalom was, but he's, he's next in line. He's the next child down. And so Adonijah hatches this plot basically to go and bring all of David's most important advisors uh, to invite all of the various sons of David except for Solomon uh, and some of the priests and all, a lot of the most important advisors, including the commander of the armies, and lead them and, and, and invite them to this feast just outside the city. And in the process of this feast, have the priests anoint him to be the next king and then come in with this kind of parade of a lot of these advisors and the sons of David and, and the priests and proclaim himself king, anointed by the priests, and have it just all kind of be done and then show up in front of David and, and give him this kind of ultimatum or say the company that it's, it's just done and now he's got to deal with it. And so basically he's going to first proclaim himself king and come and show up and just take power from his ailing father. And, and while they're having this feast, word gets around pretty quick, and Nathan, the prophet that confronted David after his sin with Bathsheba, uh, comes in to tell Bathsheba what's going on, and that you know if, if she wants to not only have her son become king, but to survive, because if it's known that Solomon was David's chosen to be king, then Adonijah is going to kill Solomon and Bathsheba to get them out of the picture to make sure that. His kingdom is his rule is unopposed, and so if you if you not only you know want to have your son become king, but if you want to survive, you need to go and talk to David and tell him what's going on, and and you know have him do something. And so Bathsheba goes in and tells David what's going on that you know that Adonijah is doing this, throwing this feast, anointing himself king, and you know, you promised me that Solomon would be king. Is he? Do you know about this? Do you know what Adonijah is doing? And as, as Bathsheba is telling him this, and as she's finishing, Nathan comes in and adds his voice and confirms everything that Bathsheba has just said. And so David you know, realizes that this is, you know, this is happening, this is serious, and he's got to do something right now if he doesn't want this to, to blow up. And so he tells Nathan to gather the priests and uh, in, the priests that are loyal and have remained, especially this one particular priest that's loyal, and all of the, the other advisors and any, any, all the important people left in Jerusalem that haven't gone out, out with Adonijah, gather them together and take Solomon to the tabernacle and anoint him to be king. To take him out and anoint him to be king and then bring him back in the city with fanfare and a parade, let him ride on David's own donkey as a as a sign of David's approval and, and of his authority and bring him back in and put him on the throne and I will basically I'll abdicate my authority and he will immediately begin to reign and be king no, no waiting until I die he'll immediately begin reigning as king and that will that will cut off Adonijah's plan and plot and so they go they do they go out they they anoint Solomon they bring him back in, they put him on the throne, and there's all this fanfare and a parade, and people are cel celebrating and shouting that Solomon, the chosen of David, has been anointed king. Uh, a lot of those that didn't know what Adonijah was doing elsewhere. And, and he's put on the throne, and he begins to, to rule, and the report goes out that David is in his bed. Uh, he, he's too sick, too, too frail to get up and come to all this coronation, but he's in his bed, bowing down, and he's... He's bowing in his bed, worshiping God in thanks for the succession of Solomon, that Solomon has become king. And so they, there's all this noise, all this shouting, and Adonijah and his little feast party over there to anoint him king, they hear all this noise. And at first, Adonijah thinks it's good news. The people are celebrating that he's coming, that he's about to be king. But then somebody comes in and tells what's happened, and Adonijah is terrified, and everybody that was there with him to support him scatters and goes and tries to pretend that this never happened. And Adonijah is actually so afraid that because of, of what he's done, Solomon, now that he has the throne, Solomon is going to have him killed, as he probably intended to have Solomon killed, that he's going to have Adonijah killed, that Adonijah goes into the tabernacle and basically hugs the corners of the altar, hugs the horns of the altar, and refuses to leave until Solomon promises not to kill him. And so Solomon sends word and says, you know, get him and, and bring him out. And as long as he hasn't you know, done anything evil, doesn't have any, done anything actually wrong, then he, he can go home. He, he'll be safe. And so he's brought for Solomon and 
they uh, he apologizes or makes good or whatever, and, and Solomon lets him go. Now, later, he is going to be killed by Solomon because he makes another attempt at the throne. Uh, it's a more subtle attempt. He, he takes, he asks Bathsheba to ask Solomon to allow him to marry Abishag the Shunammite, who was taking care of David, and that connection between David and Abishag, if, if, he, if Adonijah marries her, then that will be seen as an extra, you know, link between him and David and the throne, and so he'd have an extra claim. And Solomon so basically sees this as Adonijah's never going to give up, and so he has him, has him killed instead. Uh, but that comes a little later. And so now Solomon is firmly established. Adonijah has, has gone. All the other supporters have, have abandoned Adonijah and are at least on the surface. They're back with Solomon. Uh, and so the next chapter, in chapter 2, David is, you know, he's gone from weak and frail to dying. He's, he knows his time is coming soon. He's going to die very soon. And so he gives advice to Solomon uh, on being king. And the advice starts out being really good. I mean, it's, it's exactly the kind of stuff that you would expect. The king of this, you know, religious religiously centered nation that they are built around worshiping God. That's, that's been the whole thing from the beginning for them. Uh, all the way back to Jacob and, and then back to Abraham before Jacob, it's, it's been, we're following God. And then Moses gives the law and the whole kingdom is supposed to be orchestrated around worshiping God. And so David's advice to, to Solomon starts out very much in that vein. He says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. I'm, I'm going to die. Uh, so he said, be strong, act like a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him, keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. If your descendants watch how they live and walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, they will never fail to have a successor, or you will never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. That all sounds really good, right? That's, that's exactly the kind of advice you might expect for David to give. Be, be strong, be courageous, be faithful to God, follow his rules and decrees. And if you do this, God will bless you and, and keep his promise to me. And then there's the next paragraph, which kind of shifts. And David says, oh, there's these other guys, this group of people that, uh, these two or three people that were uh, traitorous to me or... Uh, worked against me at some point. They did, they did something wrong that I didn't like, but I couldn't kill them because of their position or because of promises that I had made. And so you use your best wisdom with them, but make sure that they don't die happy. And make sure that they, their, their head does not, their gray heads do not go to the grave in peace. Uh, so basically it was just, I'm not telling you what to do here, but make sure that they don't die happy. And so David goes from giving this really good advice from father to son to, oh yeah, settle some of my scores, please, before, you know, before it's all said and done. And then David dies and Solomon goes, up, goes about unifying and, and bringing together the kingdom. And as part of that, the, the list of people that David said to make sure that they don't die happy, uh, each one of them in turn, as they do something that conflicts with Solomon's plans or threatens Solomon's kingdom, or just gives him an excuse. He does what David wanted and, and has them killed. And the last of them is Joab, uh, the, or sorry, not Joab, Joash, the, the commander of the armies. And the, uh, or, no, it is Joab. Joash is the other commander of the other armies. Uh, but Joab, uh, the commander of the armies who had gone out with Adonijah, uh, but he decides to try the same thing that Adonijah did and run in and cling to the horns of the altar, assuming that nobody would dare to kill him in the holy place, this, this sacred place. But Solomon does, actually. When, when he refuses to come out, Solomon just sends somebody in to kill him right there, and they bury him elsewhere. Uh, and so after all of that, that kind of spate of violence is done, he's not really known for violence for most of the rest of his career until the very end. He, he then tries to have somebody killed that gets in his way. Uh, but the, and from that point on, he's not really known for violence. Instead, he works and orchestrates all of these trade agreements and peace agreements with surrounding peoples and creates this kind of prosperity. The way that he does that will cause all kinds of problems later, but we'll, we'll get to that. So the, the kingdom is now unified and in Solomon's hands. It's, it's good, it's solid, and uh, we're told that 
Solomon is faithful generally. He's like David in a lot of ways at this point. But there is this one thing that he does that's not good. He, um, he worships and he offers sacrifices and burns incense on the high places. That high places would mean, you know, any kind of, of tall hill, very high hill or mountain. Uh, and it was just these, these mountaintops or these, these tall hills were seen as being especially significant for spiritual reasons. Uh, maybe because they were especially close to heaven. They were, they were higher up and so they were very close to heaven. They, they were closer to uh, spiritual things. And so they were seen as being places with special spiritual significance. And God had given the command and the instructions in the law were to offer sacrifices only on the altar in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. So that was where they were supposed to offer sacrifices. And there's an incense altar in the tabernacle, and that's where incense is supposed to be burned for the Lord. There's just one place that this worship is all supposed to happen. But the people of Israel had started to offer sacrifices and burn incense to God on all of these various high places, these various high hills. And so there, there's disobedience there. They're not doing what God commanded. And then there's also, uh, it's not just that they're doing something they're not supposed to. It's, it's imitating or it's worshiping God in the ways that a lot of the idols of the surrounding nations are worshipped. They would use high places to build their altars to their idols and worship there. And now the people of Israel are trying to worship God in the way that these idols are worshipped. And so there's some imitation there. And so this is not good, but... Solomon is still worshiping God only, and not worshiping any idols, and so it's not good, but it's not made a big deal of, basically. He's, he's like David in most ways, but he does this thing that's not great. But God comes to him, and in a dream at night, God offers him the opportunity to ask God for anything that he wants. So he says, you know, ask me for, ask me for anything. Uh, and Solomon's response is, I am young, even almost a babe, and I don't know how to lead this people that you have given me to lead. I, I don't know how to lead such a great people as your chosen people. So give me wisdom and understanding and, and the discernment to be able to lead your people well. Basically, make me wise enough to lead your people well. And God says that because you have, have asked for this and not for something for yourself, You'll have it and the things that you didn't ask for because you asked for wisdom to lead this people and not for long life or great wealth or victory over your enemies or all any of these other things. I will give you the wisdom that you asked for and give you the wealth and the long life and, and peace. And so Solomon wakes up from his dream and realizes that God has, has spoken to him in his dream and that he's promised to give him this wisdom and all these other things. And so Solomon, in a kind of a gratitude response, begins to uh, look forward to or, or to begin the process of building the temple. And we're, you know, Solomon is always thought of as being one of the wisest men that ever lived. And we're told that, you know, as, as he, after praying this prayer or, or asking God for wisdom and discernment, that he is very wise. And there's all of these thousands of proverbs that are attributed to him, these wise sayings that guide, guide people's lives. And then beyond that, also, he wrote all of these various treatises on a bunch of different subjects, what we would now probably think of as being sciences. Uh, he, he wrote on all these different subjects and became a recognized expert in everything from astronomy to botany, well known in, in all these subjects regarding plants and animals and, and stars and their positions and their movements and planetary bodies and all this. And so he becomes exp an expert in all these fields. And then he also has this great wisdom, and he's able to discern truth in various situations. And we're given one story as a kind of example of his great wisdom. There's these two young women. They are prostitutes. They, they work as prostitutes. And they both end up pregnant at the same time, and they live together in this house. And they're the only ones there. And they end up pregnant at the same time, and first one of them gives birth to the baby, uh, to her baby. And then three days later, the other woman gives birth to her baby. And the second woman, in the middle of the night, rolls over on her baby and suffocates it. And so the baby dies. But for whatever reason, whatever motivations were, whether it was, was grief or pride or whatever, whatever reasons, that night when she wakes up and realizes what's happened, she gets up and takes the dead baby and goes to the other woman's room and switches the dead baby for the other woman's live baby and goes and lays back down with it as though it was the other woman 
who rolled over and suffocated her baby. And the next morning, the first mom, the first young woman, wakes up and looks down and sees that her child is dead and, and thinks that she suffocated her child. And then a little later, as more light gets in the room, she's able to look carefully at the baby and realizes this is not her baby. But there's nobody else in the house, nobody else that can be a witness to what's happened or to, to tell the difference between the two babies. I mean, that these two women are probably the only people that have actually seen their babies and have any chance of telling them apart. But this woman knows that this is not her baby and that the other, the other woman has stolen her baby. And so she, she goes and starts trying to get justice. And so she works up through the courts, the, the various levels of judges, and none of them can give an, an answer or can give a judgment because there's no witnesses. There's no one to say what happened or to give any extra insight. It's just one woman's word against the others. And so eventually it, all, it goes all the way up to King Solomon and Solomon himself hears the case. And when he hears all the, the description and everything, and, and at the end, the two women are both swearing, the, the live baby is mine, the dead baby is hers. And they're both saying, you know, the, light, the live baby is mine, the dead baby is hers. Solomon says, well, there's no other witnesses. There's nothing, nothing else to determine, so bring me a sword. And so one of the soldiers comes over with a sword to hand to, to Solomon. And Solomon says, take the sword and cut the live baby in half and give half to each woman. Yeah, the look of horror is, sounds right, right? But what happens is the first woman, the woman whose child the, the live baby actually is, the actual mom, says, no, don't, don't harm the baby. Give the baby to her. Better for the child to live than, than that. And the other woman, who doesn't have quite the level of attachment, says... Okay, sure. Better than, better than you getting her, getting the child, basically. And so based on the reaction of the two women, Solomon sees which one actually loves the child as a mother and says, give the, give the live child to the first woman. And because he has made that judgment in that situation with no other evidence, and he, f he found a way that's given as an example of his ability to make wise judgments, to give, give wise uh, responses to cases. And so he's seen as this very wise king. But he's, he's also started, as I mentioned, he, he begins the construction of the temple. And his father David had wanted to build a temple. Just remember, God told him that he couldn't build the temple. Instead, God would establish his house as the king, kings over Israel. But David had really wanted to build the temple, and he knew that his son was going to build the temple. And so he spent a lot of his time on the throne gathering and acquiring the materials that would be needed for the construction. And we're told at the end of, uh, of David's story in 2 Samuel and then in 1 Chronicles as well, uh, we're told about the amounts of stuff that David had gathered, and it was in the thousands of tons of gold and also thousands of tons of silver, and then even more than that in bronze and even more than that in iron and, and other metals and all these precious stones besides. And so all of this stuff that was needed for the temple had been gathered. There's still some stuff that they didn't have, though. They didn't have the stone, they didn't have the wood, and, and that kind of stuff. But the gold, the silver, the metals, David had acquired a lot of for Solomon. And some of it, uh, a good chunk of the gold and silver gets used in the decorations in the temple. It's actually used for the, the stuff of the temple. But then a lot of it is, is used actually to pay the workers that do the building. And so Solomon, uh, he wants to use the best materials that he can get. And so there is a, a kingdom to the north, kind of northwest of Israel. It's along the Mediterranean Sea, but to the north of Israel. Uh, it's called Tyre, uh, is the city. And they have access to the forests of Lebanon, where this very famous, expensive wood comes from, these, the cedars of Lebanon. Pretty sure that these are not cedars the way that we think of cedars. It's not the same species over time. The species names kind of got weird, lost, translated, strange. Uh, one thing we know that cedar, uh, cedar as we have it now is, is a softwood, and so it wouldn't make the kind of strong beams that they needed to, to build large structures around. Uh, and so we don't, it's, it's not the same cedar that we know of, but it was some kind of very well sought after or very sought after wood. It was, it was very expensive. And so Solomon sends to the king of Tyre to, uh, to send him these, these cedars, and in response... He, or in, in payment, he will provide food for the king's household, this king of Tyre's household, for the rest of his, his kingdom, the rest of the time that Solomon is, is on the throne. 
And so the description is this incredible amount of olive oil and flour and, and grain and bread is sent to the king of, of Tyre every so often to provide food for his household. Like tens of thousands of baths, uh, which is, you know, imagine you know, several, several gallons, a couple of, couple of big barrels full is a bath. And that's sent to the king of, of Tyre every year in response to or in payment for this wood that he's harvesting from Lebanon or from the, the forest of Lebanon. But in order to provide the labor to get the, the cedars, it, it's not just the people of Tyre, the, the, king, the king of Tyre, it's not just his people that are cutting the wood. Solomon also sends some of his own workers, in fact, quite a few of his own workers, to the tune of tens of thousands of workers. And he conscripts them, which means that they aren't given a choice. They're told, go and cut these, the cedar. And the arrangement is that they go and they cut one month out of the year and they work to get, or one month they'll go and cut and get, get materials for Solomon's temple or for the temple to be built. And then they'll come home and they'll work for two months in their own fields and to provide food for their own families and their own, their own people. And then they're back again for a month and they come back in two months. And so they run this alternation all year long where for one month they, they cut timber and then for two months they, they work the fields and make sure that their families get to eat. And so the timber starts to come in, but Solomon also needs stone. He needs these huge blocks of stone to serve as the foundation for the temple and to, to construct the, some of the parts of the temple itself. And so he also conscripts another set of tens of thousands of laborers and sends them to quarry stone, same deal. They work for a month, they, they come home for two months. And they're paid for their work at the, when they go to work, when they go to cut the forest or cut the timber, or when they go and, and get the stone from the quarry, either way, whichever they're going to, they're paid for their work, but they're taken away from their homes and they're not able to work their fields, and so their fields are less productive. If, if you're around farming at all, you know that if you have to every two months leave your fields alone for a month and then you come back, things are going to happen. Weeds are going to grow. Th things are going to happen to make you less productive. But they do the work and they have all the stuff and they, they build the temple and the temple is magnificent. It's huge. It's gorgeous. And the kind of the decorative motif that you see in the temple is there's all of these flowers and all of these fruits and all, all these various depictions of natural things. And the whole intention is that when you walk into the temple, you feel like you're stepping back into the Garden of Eden. Uh, because the Garden of Eden, it's, it's a place, the place where God would come and speak to Adam and Eve, the, speak to humanity every day. It was a place where God's presence and humanity coexisted. Heaven and earth met in Eden. And that's what the temple is supposed to be, the place where God's presence dwells and humanity can come and be in God's presence again. And there's this, it's a meeting place between God and humanity. And so there's all of these flower depictions everywhere and all these pomegranate depictions, fruits and, and various things, trees are, are prominent. And the inside of the Holy of Holies is described as being, there's, there's wood on every surface and then that wood is overlaid with gold and various decorations and patterns, but nowhere do you see stone. You can't see any stone from inside the, the Holy of Holies. You see wood and all these depict depictions of beauty and fruits and vegetables and, and trees and things. And it's all wood surfaces covered in gold. And so it's all meant to make you think of the Garden of Eden, this, this meeting place between God and humanity, between heaven and earth. And so that's the, the decoration theme of the temple is to make you think of the Garden of Eden. And it's all built and, and it, it, it's, it's gorgeous. There's gold everywhere. It's probably, we would think of it as gaudy, but it, it, was, it was really impressive and, and extremely beautiful and took you know, years to, to finish. And when it's finally finished, Solomon prays, there's this, this dedication ceremony and Solomon prays this prayer, giving thanks to God for, for the temple and for allowing to build it, for being you know, God, God leading the people and and being their God, and in the midst of that prayer, Solomon says you know, that the heavens and the earth are not able to contain you. The, the heavens and the earth can't contain God's presence, God's glory, much less this house that I have built. But even so, even though the temple, as grand as it is, is not adequate to God's glory, even so, please come and dwell with us here and hear your people's prayers when they pray towards this temple. Uh, wherever they may be in the world, hear them when they pray uh, facing towards this temple. And uh, yeah, 
it's great dedication and, and even in the midst of it solomon is, is aware that it has some humility that the temple as grand as it is is not enough but you know the, the temple building is done it's it's finished but solomon doesn't end the conscripted labor instead he has them continue working and first he builds himself a grand palace and it takes 13 years to build that palace and then he also builds a palace for his wife uh, before this, he has been, uh, he, he got married to the daughter of Pharaoh from Egypt. And so he's married the daughter of Pharaoh of Egypt and brought her to Israel. And so then he builds this grand palace for himself and it's the administrative center and, and has everything that he needs to, uh, to run the kingdom, his throne room and, and all the, the areas and offices that various people would need are, are there as well as his private residence. And then he also builds this a similar, though smaller, grand palace for his wife, and then eventually for all his wives. Uh, they all kind of live in his harem there. Uh, but the, he marries uh, marries the prince, princess of Egypt and brings her there and builds her this grand palace. And these these palaces take decades, a couple decades to build. And so Solomon spends you know thirty years or so in all these grand construction projects, using all this conscripted labor that people have to be away from their, their homes and their families and away from their own jobs and their own, their own growing for a third of their, their year. Solomon also uh, divides up the kingdom in, you know, it's supposed to be, the, the, the understanding should be that you've got the 12 tribes and each of the 12 tribes are united under this one king. Solomon sees that that's, you know, that, that works okay, but it's, it's kind of inefficient. And so he reorganizes the nation around instead of 12 tribes, it's 12 principalities or 12 uh, subdivisions of the kingdom, 12 governorships or whatever, you want, whatever term you want to use. Uh, there, there are 12, think of them as states. And they kind of, these, the borders of these, these states, these principalities roughly align with the old tribal system, but they're not perfect. And so in some cases you have quite a few mixing of two or three different tribes. Uh, two, two or three different uh, tribes' lands will get uh, bowled over and united into one. And so the, you end up with these kind of 12 more equal principalities instead of following the 12 tribal divisions. And then each of these 12 principalities are responsible for providing the uh, food and equipment and supplies, basically for providing everything needed for Solomon's household one month out of the year. And so each of the 12 provides food for food and, and supplies one month out of the year. And that doesn't sound too bad until you realize how big Solomon's household has gotten. Uh, Solomon keeps marrying these women from foreign tribes in order to, to secure these alliances. Uh, these trade deals that we were talking about earlier, he makes them largely by marrying into these various families to create that connection and to keep peace. Because nobody wants to invade a country where their daughter might get killed in the process. So if you, you bring in somebody's daughter into your kingdom, chances are they're not gonna attack you anymore. And so there's, you know, he, he has all these marriages in order to secure these alliances, and he ends up marrying 700 women in order to make all these alliances. And then, because the 700 women apparently just aren't enough for one guy, he also takes on 300 concubines, servants that he sleeps with, basically. They're not wives, but he sleeps with them. And so he ends up with this harem of a thousand women that has to be sustained. And then there's also you know, Solomon and all of his, his children, all of his advisors, all of the nobles that, that help him run the kingdom, all of the, the people involved in the day-to-day -day work of the kingdom, all the servants in the household, they all eat at Solomon's table. And so all of those people have to be fed. But then there's all the others, the guests that would come and, and those that came to see Solomon and, and all, all these other people that would come in. And so there's, there's thousands of people being fed by Solomon every day. And then he also has this kind of side habit or side hobby. He loves having horses. He loves raising horses and having these, you know, building up this kind of chariot army or, or chariot group. And so he, Solomon personally has 12,000 horses that all have to be fed every day. And so by the time Solomon's household is done, uh, there's a description of the amount of food that Solomon's household consumes every day. And there's, there's just tons and tons and tons of grain and flour and wine and uh, fruits and vegetables and various kinds of meat. And there's a description of the number of cattle that are killed or are slaughtered every day to provide food for Solomon's household. And there, it's a total of 30. There are 30 cattle killed every day to feed the people that Solomon feeds. 
And if y'all ever, you know, worked in a grocery store or, or you've been connected with any kind of, of beef production, you know that a cow can produce hundreds of pounds of meat. A full grown cow will produce hundreds of pounds of meat times 30 every day. And that's not the only meat. There are also, you know, dozens of sheep and goats and, and wild game caught out in the fields and, and uh, birds, uh, kind of poultry-like birds that are, are killed to, to provide food. There's all of this stuff and that's just the meat. And then the bread and the grain and the, all the other stuff, the things that would go with it and the wine and all the other stuff that they would eat. It's a huge amount. And by the end of, of Solomon's career, the provision for one month for each of these 12 principalities, they're able to provide one month of this food and drink. <clears throat> it's taking them about half of the year to store up and to get up everything that they have to send for the one month of Solomon's household to eat. And then they only have the other half of the year to produce for themselves. And they're still having to do the one third conscripted labor, two thirds at home in order to provide that for Solomon and still have to eat some somehow themselves. And so Solomon becomes, the, Jerusalem in the area becomes fabulously wealthy. It's, it's an incredible display of power and wealth and, and leadership and administration. But as you get further and further away from Jerusalem and you get further out to the other areas, things get more and more desperate, kind of ugly. And Solomon, in order to meet some of the labor demands along the way, he's not only been conscripting the labor of the Israelites, he's also now conscripted the labor of all the foreigners that live in the land. And they aren't given the whole one-third, two-thirds deal, and they aren't necessarily paid. And so basically he enslaves all of the foreigners in the land. And there's, remember, this kind of building comparison between Solomon and Pharaoh of Egypt. And it's not just Pharaoh of Egypt during Solomon's time, it's Pharaoh of Egypt in Exodus. The Pharaoh that enslaved the Hebrews, the foreigners that lived among them in order to enrich himself and out of fear of what they might do, and that God leads the people out of Egypt. That Pharaoh. Solomon has begun being much like David. He is the son of David. He is, is a lot like his father, except for the thing about offering sacrifices on the high places. But then, over time, he... He becomes more and more and more like the tyrannical pharaoh of Egypt from Exodus. And by the end of it, the last kind of story in Solomon's life is he has married all these women. He's got this, this thousand women that he's, he's connected with, 700 of them his wives. And they have brought in their foreign idols because they were originally from other places. And they brought in the idols that they worshipped growing up, the, the idols from their lands. And Solomon has begun to worship those idols on the high places in addition to worshiping God. And the man that built the temple is now also building worship places for Baal and Asherah and Dagon and all these other gods and goddesses of all the foreign, foreign peoples that all of his wives have come from. And he's joining them in worship. So he's committing idolatry. And so God tells, uh, tells him that because of what he's done, because he's turned away from God, because he's committed idolatry, God is going to take most of the kingdom away from him and give it to someone else. And so ten tribes are going to be taken from Solomon and given to somebody else. But out of respect for David and for the promise that God made to David, Solomon will be left with two and his, his son will reign over two tribes and all the rest will, will be taken away. And so Solomon ends up having a son named Rehoboam. And there's also one of Solomon's advisors is named Jeroboam. And so you've got to keep these two separate. Rehoboam, Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the advisor, God tells him he is going to be made king over the, the ten tribes. But God is going to leave uh, Solomon and his family with, with two tribes. And when, when Solomon hears that this is going to happen and he figures out that Jeroboam is kind of gaining support and assumes that Jeroboam is going to be the one that God gives the nation, these other tribes to, he tries to have Jeroboam killed. And so in this great twist, this great irony, Jeroboam flees from Israel, from the anointed of God, from, from Solomon. He flees and hides in Egypt. Great irony. The, the anointed king, the, the one chosen by God, is fleeing from Israel, from the promised land, to hide in Egypt. The place that God had brought his chosen out of to bring them to the promised land. And so there's this, this great reversal, and by the end of Solomon's story, he's become more like the pharaoh of Egypt. Than the, the enslaving pharaoh of Egypt. 
than David, his father. Uh, that will stop there, and on Monday, your assignment will continue, and we'll start to look at the divided kingdom, the, the split that happens under Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Jeroboam comes back and they ends up with Jeroboam, king of Israel, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and that's the end of the United Monarchy. Uh, we'll pick up with that on Monday, and I'll see you guys back on Friday.